Welcome to Purpose 360. I'm Carol Cohn. And I'm Chris Noble. And we're on a journey to explore the brightest and most innovative minds and initiatives in social purpose. Today, companies and brands must stand for something meaningful. They have to have a social purpose and bring that purpose forward to their employees, their customers, and their community. Each episode, we're talking to leaders at Fortune 100 companies, global brands, social enterprise startups, NGOs, and everything in between. We'll be taking a deep dive to learn how they are integrating purpose into their organizations. To benefit both business and society for enduring impact. Join us. Welcome to Purpose 360. I'm Carol Cohn. And I'm Chris Noble. And we have a wonderful, wonderful episode for you today. With us is Pablo Jimenez, and he is the Global Vice President of Reputation and Communications for AB InBev. Or for those of you who know the AB part coming from the U.S., Anheuser Busch. And so, Pablo, it's just, you know, welcome to our show. We are thrilled to have you today. Hi, Carol. Hi, Chris. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be here with your audience. I always like to start with the numbers. And AB InBev is a company of amazing size and tremendous consolidation. It came to being in 2008. Its revenues are in excess of $54 million, with over 175,000 employees around the globe representing over 500 brands in 100 countries. And so how this company has come together, and it has a very, very powerful, powerful purpose, um, is what we're going to get into today. Because not only coming together, but then how you continue to grow and have a unified culture and vision but also the individual nature of the brands with their wonderful personalities. That's a really delicate balance. And so, Pablo, just let's just start with a little bit about AB InBev's purpose, and then I'd like to read your manifesto. Absolutely, Carol. Our purpose, what we call our dream, is to bring people together for a better world. This is part of what we call dream people culture. That is a set of 10 principles. And we are convinced that a culture is what really defines our company. It really defines not only who we are, but also how we act. It really unifies and drives all of our people. It's been a non-negotiable element uh, in all of our combination. It's a critical component for us. And we believe it's uh, maybe the recipe of our success. I think it truly is a recipe of your success. So let's just take step back for a moment. And I and both Chris and I would love to know a little bit about your background and the focus of your current role. Very happy to share that with you. I joined AB InBev approximately six years ago. I joined what we call our Middle America's Zone uh, as uh, responsible for legal and corporate affairs. And I recently moved just over a year ago to a global role. I'm now fortunate enough to be in charge of uh, what we call our reputation and communications team. I see my role and the role of our team as connectors. We are responsible for bringing the outside-in perspective uh, for the company and also making sure that we connect our company to our main audiences through sharing our stories. To a certain extent, we see ourselves, Carol and Chris, as gatekeepers of the principle. We are doing what we say and we are saying what we do. And I'm going to get right into the, to the manifesto because um, I just read this and I found it so profound. We are a company of owners. We believe that you get out what you put in. We strive to be the best, pursuing our dream, committed to improving lives for more people in more communities. For centuries, we've been bringing people together through sports, through music, and through culture, creating moments both every day and extraordinary moments, seizing every occasion to serve up more of what people thirst for. For this reason, we pour ourselves into our work, from farm to brewery to market, taking pride and ownership in every step, crafting great beer from the best natural ingredients, paving the road for a better tomorrow that we're proud to be part of, and celebrating the great times that bring us together. 
We are AB InBev, bringing people together for a better world. That is such a fabulous manifesto. And it's right, you know, right up front on your website. And I love the fact that you talk about pursuing our dream, committed to improving lives for people in more communities. And then you talk about how you do it. So now that we're going to dive into our questions, we're going to put you on the spot, Pablo. And we want to know what's your favorite beer. <laughs> oh, that's a that's a tough question, Carol. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we knew that. We and, knew that. Uh, and, and I would say that it really depends on on the occasion. For example, if I'm thinking about the reward for a day of physical activity, I am totally partial for Michelob Ultra. This is a beautiful beer, low in calories, low in carbs, full flavor, great beer. If I'm enjoying a burger, I'm a totally fan and a sucker for uh, for burgers. I love having a nice cold Budweiser. At the same time, if I'm talking about sabering and uh, pairing, I would say that Lefe Blond and Stella Artois are one of my key uh, beers uh, and my favorites. So it's it's really about the occasion. And the great thing is that since we have over 500 beers in our portfolio, uh, you can really have uh, the opportunity to choose from many great beers. And that was a great answer because, you know, if you always ask, which of your children do you love the most? <laughs> you always say all. <laughs> so thank you. That, that, was, that, was, that was a, gr- a great, mm. very appropriately political and very real answer. So thank you. It, it's so, totally so let's true. get totally into your authentic. purpose. <laughs> See, it's, it's, it's October. And, you know, now that, the, now that the months are starting to end in R, you know, I, I enjoy both the Blue Point beer and the Blue Point oysters. So I think those pair really well together. Right. But but you're right. It has to it has to fit the occasion. That's a great pairing. <laughs> Absolutely, Chris. It's about the occasion. Going to uh, authenticity. We know that beer has been bringing people together for hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands. We've seen countless new friendships, connections and great experiences built over the shared love of beer. And we do think that beer is part of the life's greatest moments. And we want that continue to be the case. And since we're building a company to last for our employees, for our consumers, and we want our company and our great beers to be there for the next 100 and plus years, uh, we have to stay true to our culture and uh, stay true to our dream. And of course, we can talk a little bit more about how is that we actually bring this dream into life. That would be great because. How did the purpose come to be? You know, what was the process that you went through? Identifying it is really hard. It has to be real. But then how do you embed it is even harder. So um, let me share with you a a beautiful story that our CEO, Carlos Brito, likes to uh, to share with, uh, with folks. It was approximately 10 years ago. When during a Q&A while visiting a university for identifying uh, candidates for what we called our global MBA program, uh, a person uh, raised her hand and asked a question. Her name uh, was Ludmila from Ukraine, and she asked a question that, uh, as Brito can tell you, he has been trying to respond and bring to life ever since, uh, not only himself, but also with, uh, with senior management of the company and uh, with uh, several of our colleagues in a very wide exercise. And the question was, what would the world miss if your company did not exist? That's a super thoughtful question. And uh, from, uh, from the story from Brito, uh, he was, he was uh, paralyzed for a few seconds and he started thinking about so many ways to uh, respond to that question. In the end, uh, his response was, that's a great question. <laughs> Let us think a little bit about it. And, uh, and I offer to come back to you and tell you a little bit more of what is that the world would miss if our company did not exist. And as you can only imagine, this, this resulted in really thoughtful discussions and soul searching in several ways and forms. And we came to the conclusion that what is really authentic to beer is to bring people together. So we bring people together, as you read in the manifesto, in so many ways and forms, from the simplest moments of sharing a beer with family and friends, to the big stage events, to the greatest sports events, to the biggest cultural moments. But we, of course, want to make every experience with beer uh, to be a positive one. And the other point of bringing it to life is that we recognize that despite the fact that we're a global company, a company with a global reach, we are very local in nature. Our business is very local. 
uh, because we source most of our materials locally. We employ local colleagues. We brew most of our beers locally and we sell our beers into the communities and our consumers are part of those communities as our employees are. So we want to be part of those communities. And when you're part of the community, you're expected to be part of the solution. Did you have a task force? Did you um, query your employees from different countries? What was the op- how did you operationalize discovering the purpose? Absolutely. So it was a wide, very thoughtful exercise that included, I would say, all of the zones where we operate and colleagues from different levels in different exercises, from focus groups to surveys, and also a very thoughtful reflection on the conclusions by our senior management. And so it was a very, I would say, a very inclusive process. uh, And it came up to, uh, to reflect really and truly who we are and what we identify as our dream. Again, uh, bringing people together. How long did it take? to do that? A few months, the the full exercise. But I I would say that bringing our dream to life is a never-ending process because we do that day after day and function after function. This is a joint effort and it's a cross-functional dream as every dream needs to be and as the purpose needs to be. And the way we bring it to life in the different functions through the different brands, of course, is unique. And, uh, and then it's a never ending process. That's that's great. And, and you also have on on your purpose, you've added for the next hundred plus years. And so why did you add that kind of long horizon to it? Because we're here for the long run. Again, as, as beer has been a witness of centuries of friendships and connections. And we think that uh, life is better with beer. Uh, That's why we're in this business. Uh, We want uh, to continue brewing the best beers and bringing people together for the next 100 years. So that's for our consumers and that's also for our employees because we want to build something that is bigger than ourselves. So for those listeners, um, I'd love to just get your point of view. Is it important in a purpose to add some time-bound nature to it? I I think that the purpose has to be longstanding. Uh, Of course, uh, you have to figure also how is that you're going to get there and how is that you're going to evaluate progress. So you have to have certain ways to measure how is that you're doing towards achieving your purpose. The purpose and the dream have to be uh, really longstanding and something that is so big that you almost never fully achieve it. It has to continue propelling you and inspiring you. As Brito, our CEO, likes to say, It takes the same amount of effort to dream small or to dream big. So we want to dream big. And actually, that really ties into, you know, the larger vision ties into then how you operationalize that and and roll it out. And I I know that we're going to talk about some of the consumer facing programs, but, but I want to start kind of working inside out. One of the things that both your CEO and I think the company espouses is this ownership culture. Uh, then encourages people to take ownership, but also then to dream bigger and achieve more. H- how does your purpose kind of spill out through your culture to your employees? And, and what does it mean to work for AB and Bev? Uh, that's a great question. And, uh, and everything starts from culture, as you mentioned, what we called dream people culture or 10 principles that propels us and that inspire us. Those are basically founded on concept of ownership, informality, meritocracy and simplicity. And this is the way we approach our day-to-day life uh, uh, in the company, but also our goals. Green people culture needs to be a living element that you refer to day in and day out when you're making business decisions. And talking about ownership and, and simplicity, when we decided that we want to bring our purpose into life, is that we identify that we have to be true to ourselves, that we have to identify what is the intersection that would allow us to have not only lasting impact in the communities, but also lasting impact on our business? Uh, because the only way for you to adopt a purpose that stands uh, and that sticks over the years is to do something that really, number one, authentic to your brand and to your company. Number two, that uh, matters to your consumers and also inspires your employees. And of course, that it's aligned to your business. And, and I'm curious, the, te- the 10 principles, which, which are very well stated, um, how do they translate 
across the different cultures. Uh, when you acquire um, a new set of companies, um, obviously they're very, very different. And is there a process by which they become dreamers? They learn of the principles? Is it part of their KPIs? So talking about ownership, uh, this is this is a great opportunity uh, because this is one of uh, the key principles of our culture. We are a company of owners and owners take results personally. This means that our colleagues care and act because this is their company. This is our company. We like to think that owners identify gaps, the way we call to areas that need improvement, and then develop plans to close them. And as we are never completely satisfied with our results, this is a never-ending process of continuous improvement. Owners take the initiative and don't wait to receive instructions or directions from others. And, and here I would like to, uh, to use a, a, an example that our, that our CEO uh, uses to illustrate this principle. And it's the example of a rental car. Uh, as Brito says, uh, when driving a rental car, some folks may not take the exact uh, amount of care with a car as if it was their own car. They're not necessarily uh, paying attention to every detail and to every noise in the car because it's a rental. On the other hand, these same folks, when driving their own car, they are extremely careful and they want to make sure that everything is working exactly right in the car. And these are the owners. Th that you know, The consistency and um, the simplicity of it is just, it's just, really important for our listeners to learn. I, I, I think that you touch upon a very critical point, uh, Carol, because uh, culture, I mean, culture can, and certainly uh, has uh, different elements from one country to the other, from one geography to the other. But when you talk about co corporate culture, uh, you, have to, uh, you have to make sure that, in, in our opinion, of course, different companies have different approaches. Uh, that, uh, in our opinion, culture has to be a unifying element. Uh, and for you to uh, to be successful in that effort, you have to, number one, communicate it very clearly. Number one, to show through behavior what you really mean by your culture. But it, uh, the third element Ed, that you mentioned, it has to be based on simplicity and common sense, uh, because that's the only way that you can actually make this culture stick uh, irrespective of the geography and the moment in time. It has to be based on, on simplicity and common sense. That's actually tied back to ownership, right? Because, in fact, it ties all the way back to the right beer for the right situation, right? If you, if you look across, the, the consistent theme is to use these principles as a framework, but then to project them into the individual owner's situation, the individual business unit situation, the individual brand situation, so that they are um, appropriate and principled still, but but consistent with the brand and, and the mission at hand. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think that, that I really want to emphasize that when, when I read all the background, your Fortune magazine interviews, all your other interviews, your videos, that this is a company that is about performance and about growth. And that when you have acquired and made major acquisitions, you've had double digit significant growth. So this isn't just the squishy stuff about culture. I mean, it's the power of and that I always talk about, that in having this clear culture, clear purpose, the simple principles, and then, you know, living them and breathing them, that this has helped the company exponentially grow as well as bond your people together and into just loving um, the company overall and their individual companies. But now I want to start going to some of the individual actions you've taken. And I know, Chris, you were just, you know, you had called me up and you said, I cannot believe that Budweiser is going to make its 100 percent commitment. Do you want to get into that, Chris? There's a whole host of huge issues that uh, corporations have to tackle now um, as they become more citizens of the world. And, and I don't, I don't think there's one that is, uh, as common to everybody's experience, especially supply line and distribution as climate change and, uh, the need for renewable, uh, solutions and sustainable solutions. So I wanted you to talk just a little bit about the, the commitment to making beer with 100% renewable electricity and, and how you're going to achieve that in the U.S. and, and other markets. Perfect. So um, 
we think that that was that was a very bold uh, step by by Budweiser because we we decided that we want to use we wanted to use and we want to continue using the power and the reach of our brands to uh, to inspire consumers and to drive action. So this was very authentic to uh, to Budweiser. Our research in the U.S. told us that of course climate change is an important issue for our consumers. However, as you also know, it is not always easy for us as consumers to understand how is that our everyday actions can really make a difference. And a brand as powerful as Budweiser can help bridge the gap between what consumers are interested into and what consumers uh, can do to uh, get up to be part of the action that makes a difference. Uh, so that's uh, where we decided that uh, we would commit Budweiser to uh, be brewed in the United States initially and then throughout the world by 2025 uh, with uh, only renewable electricity coming from uh, renewable sources. And we decided, so different from other approaches where uh, the sustainability platform is basically a corporate initiative, we decided that this was going to be also a brand initiative. So Budweiser committed to using only renewable electricity by 2025. It started in the U.S. Uh, and we launched, as you know, this renewable electricity symbol uh, that it is, it is added uh, to our packaging, uh, including primary packaging, meaning the bottles and the cans, uh, so as to inform our consumers uh, and to help them make better purchasing decisions. And a very important thing here is that uh, we sell around 41 million Budweiser's around the world every day. This means that we can prompt as much as 41 million uh, organic conversations by including this renewable electricity symbol and really have our consumers driving the right conversations uh, to make change. Was it difficult to have your colleagues and brand for Budweiser agree to put that um, bug, uh, you know, put that communication on the can? That's like committed i think that um always launching an initiative as bold and uh and as uh as important as this one with a brand that is so powerful that has such a great heritage it's a very important decision and has to be very thoughtful and as you can anticipate this was this was this decision was informed by significant amount of data knowing what was uh, what is important for our company again what was important for our consumers but at some point, it felt just like the, the right thing to do. And it is very authentic to, um, to Budweiser. Uh, I mean, we say, and you have heard our CEO state uh, that sustainability is truly our business. Sustainability is our business uh, because uh, brewing uh, great beer, such as Budweiser, really depends on healthy, natural environment. Beer is brewed with natural ingredients. So uh, Budweiser participating in the climate action conversation was only natural for for, for the brand. And, and uh, we're very excited that uh, Budweiser took this uh, bold stand. And we're way ahead in the, uh, I, I mean, we're uh, making great progress in this commitment. Uh, by now, we have, uh, as a company, uh, more than uh, 50% of our, of our goal reached out. So we have already per, uh, power purchase agreements uh, that represent more than 50% of our purchased electricity uh, coming from renewable sources. So we're uh, making great progress and uh, we'll continue using Budweiser to drive the right conversations. And, and what were consumers' responses to that? We'd love to, we would love to have seen the social media and what were they saying? Overall, uh, consumer reaction has been very positive. Again, uh, it feels authentic. Climate is an important issue uh, for consumers, not only in the U.S., but throughout the world. And the, uh, the response has been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, for Budweiser to take a stand and to, uh, to uh, do what we're doing. You know, I, I know you guys have been doing uh, for, for some years now, uh, swapping out the canning lines to canned water instead of beer to respond to national disasters and emergencies. I want to talk a little bit about the Super Bowl advertisement you guys launched last year and what it did for the brand, um, how, you, how you were able to take cause and helping out in the moment and make it part of kind of the longer term vision for AB InBev. That's a great point in, in uh, really uh, the uh, emergency drinking water efforts by, by Anheuser-Busch in the U.S. have been uh, part of a longstanding commitment. The company has been doing this since 1988, uh, working with, uh, with 
red, with the Red Cross and with other partners to provide more than 80 million cans of, uh, of safe, uh, pure water uh, in, uh, in the midst of natural disasters. It is something, again, that is very authentic to who we are. It's uh, something that we can that we can really use our knowledge, our logistics, and our and our production facilities to periodically pause the beer production, uh, basically in our in our brewery in Fort Collins and Cartersville in Georgia, uh, to can water and to be ready to distribute it when disaster strikes. Uh, so this is not a fad. It is not something that we have done once and then try to take credit for it. It's something that uh, the company has been doing for a long time, and we plan to continue doing it because. We're in a good position to help our communities that we are part of. And this really makes us very proud. So we received very good feedback from social media and also earned media and traditional after this uh, piece of advertisement, which I think it was really moving and inspiring, not only from uh, our consumers, it also really inspired our own people because they see that their efforts uh, really come to life and that we really mean when we say that we want to be part of the communities. We, we want to be part of the solutions. You know, one of the things that I just is stunning about your work is that you just don't do these incredible ads. The ads are a communication of really deep and authentic commitment of uh, whether it's renewable energy or uh, providing water and disasters. And so you really walk the talk. And so j just, you know, kudos to you. Um, I'd like to shift a little bit to um, cause marketing where, um, you know, I've, I've seen the ad many, many times and I love it. It's the Stella Artois and the waterdart.org um, partnering for buy a lady, a drink campaign. Um, and, and so, um, it's, it's a, I'm curious about how that developed, but also what kind of guidance do you or not from corporate give the individual brands to engage in whether it's sustainability, uh, communities, social issues or such? Just going first to the, to your second question, every brand, uh, I mean, going back to the, uh, to the point of ownership. That means that we have to take results personally, and uh, and the the the, the brand uh, the the people in, in charge of the different brands uh, have uh, a freedom to uh, to identify what's the real and the best way to bring uh, our dream to life. Uh, so there's not necessarily a mandate uh, for the brands to uh, to adopt one platform or the other. The brands really have to. Uh, to find out what's what's really authentic for them, what's really meaningful uh, and matters to their consumers, and then what is really aligned to their platform. And there's a freedom within a framework because we do believe uh, in ownership, and that's a core element of our of our culture, as we mentioned. And regarding this this particular program, which I think is fantastic, uh, Stella Artois, as you know, has been. Uh, working and part and has partnered with uh, Water.org of Gary White and Matt Damon since 2015, and the purpose of this partnership is to provide people in the developing world uh, with long-term sustainable access to clean water. Uh, we're very proud that as part of this partnership to date, we have been able to help provide access to clean water for over two million people, and our goal is uh, to reach 3.5 million in the next couple of years. And, and this brings me uh, to to a point uh, which we think is critical here: the the importance of finding the right partners. For most of the times, these challenges are so big and so complex that it's very difficult to believe that one single company or one single individual or organization or even government can really make a difference. Uh, seeking partners uh, it's fundamental for really driving uh, and scaling change, and we have been very fortunate and very in, and are very happy to see how the partnership with water.org is is moving along. And and I assume that those partners are vetted at the at the local brand level. So they have to your point ownership and responsibility to uh identify and then make them work. Uh, absolutely. So uh, we we have uh in this conversation mentioned uh our two of our global brands. We have three global brands, Budweiser, Stellar Plan, and Corona. And each one of them has its uh, its platform, and it's uh, each one of the platforms is authentic to the brand, uh, and and it touches upon this intersection of being authentic, uh, being something that matters, and being aligned uh, to its business. 
Um, however, uh, as you also, well, also mentioned in the beginning, Carol, we have over 500 brands around the world and uh, in local regional uh, brands uh, have also adopted uh, platforms and, and, and cost marketing. And uh, in the, the cases or the framework is the same. It has to be uh, it has to be authentic. It has to resonate with consumers and uh, it must be something that uh, has the capacity to uh, to be longstanding because it's aligned with our business model and with the uh, personality of the brand. In a way, your your view for, you know, over the next hundred years gives um, some freedom to your colleagues to commit to something on the longer term, which, which does then translate down to consumers because they see it again and again and again, and they understand your commitment. So very, very well done. Absolutely, because uh, uh, with, free, with, uh, with ownership, uh, with, with freedom, I, I mean, we, we can easily connect freedom with ownership. Uh, so our colleagues for sure have freedom to, uh, to bring the, the, the dream to life uh, as we are all owners, and we want to make sure that everyone can identify a way in which uh, his or her efforts uh, can really drive the actions uh, as long as we keep uh, clarity that we're taking results personally and that we are owners that take uh, projects from beginning to end and we live with the consequences of our actions uh, and and that should drive to the same uh, principle of one team, one dream. Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly right. And that actually kind of leads us further down the, the purpose path, if you will, right? So if you look at... Uh, AB InBev as a as a global citizen and your action on issues. Now we're turning towards uh, kind of direct interaction with consumers and how the brand uh, works its purpose into that interaction. Uh, as a producer of alcohol, y- you guys face the reality that your products can cause harm. You've got a lot of initiatives around the world that promote responsible drinking, including efforts to shift social drinking norms to support uh, WHO's target of reducing harmful use of alcohol and, and even just kind of set global smart drinking goals. Can, can you tell us about that interaction, right? How now we're at the, at the product level, how do you work with consumers to make sure they're being safe and responsible? And, and what does that commitment look like? First, let me start by saying that we believe that every experience with beer should be a positive one. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we recognize that the harmful use of alcohol is bad. And it's not bad only for for individuals, but also it can be for their families, uh, for their communities. And of course, it is bad in the end for business. Uh, and if we, if we live by our dream of bringing people together for a better world, which is uh, our dream, we, we, we need to make sure that we're able to continue bringing people together for the next 100 years and beyond. And for doing that, we can only achieve it by working within thriving communities across the globe. To that point is that uh, in close alignment with with the goals of the uh, World Health Organization, the WHO, is that uh, back in December 2015, we launched uh, what we call our Global Smart Drinking Goals. And the target, again, in alignment with the WHO, is to reduce the harmful use of alcohol by at least 10% uh, by 2025. And, and we did this by recognizing that we had to move from awareness to really driving change and measuring impact. As you all know, the beer industry uh, has been um, working on awareness campaigns for decades. So sending the right messages that you should not drink and drive that you should not abuse alcohol, that you should not sell alcohol to uh, underage folks. However, we, we thought that it was clearly a moment for us to move from awareness to drive action. And that's, uh, that's why we decided to go with our global smart drinking goals that are basically covering four different areas. One of them is uh, to launch six, uh, what we call city pilots across the world. Uh, where we can identify uh, evidence-based solutions that we can later replicate and scale. That's number one. The number two is uh, uh, investing our commitment to invest in at least $1 billion uh, up to 2025 in social marketing campaigns to drive positive behavior. So th- the goal here is changing behavior. The third one is to, uh, to promote uh, better alcohol literacy. 
So that really means providing more information to our consumers so they can make educated choices when uh, drinking alcohol or deciding not to drink alcohol. And fourth, and very important to us as well, to reach at least 20% of our beer volumes by 2025 with no and low alcohol beer, what we call NABLAB, no and low, low alcohol beer. And by low alcohol beer, we mean uh, beers that have 3.5% alcohol volume. And now we stand around 8% in this goal. And we have over six, uh, 70, 76, close to 80 offerings uh, in, in the NABLAB space. So those are basically the, uh, the smart drinking goals. Because again, we recognize that the harmful use of alcohol is bad for individuals, colleagues, families, communities, and for our business. And we, uh, we want every experience with beer to be a positive one for the next 100 years and beyond. Again, how did you establish those? Did you have subcommittees? Did, and I know, so how did that happen? But also, did you have headwinds internally? Did you have any naysayers that said, no, no, it's got to be the responsibility of an individual. It's not our role. It could, this sounds so smart, Pablo, that you must have had a few bumps in the road. Internally, perhaps, or externally, or both. This, these goals are for sure, Carol. The process of uh, an evolution uh, in the way we think and we we approach um, smart drinking. Uh, we have always been uh, uh, clear that we, as a as a large company producing alcohol beverages, we have to play a significant role in this space. Uh, but uh, the way how 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 to really approach that situation has been a matter of evolution. And of course, here I go back to the point of partnerships. We did not came uh, with the global smart drinking goals by ourselves in, within our four walls. We actually engage with experts, uh, with independent experts, with uh, members of the academia. And this was really an effort for us to learn and to come up with what we truly believed was going to be able to make an impact. So partnerships uh, are key for achieving uh, uh, real uh, big dreams and for bringing these smart drinking goals to life. It's an example uh, when we mentioned the, uh, the city pilots in six different cities around the world. Uh, we work very closely with governments. We work very closely with, uh, with, with universities. We work, of course, with the, uh, with the civil society, with the communities, um, because uh, the, uh, the, the, the problems are so big and so complex that uh, no one can really tackle them alone. But we do believe that by doing this together in a, in a thoughtful way, we can really make a difference and uh, have a long-standing impact that we can later replicate based on evidence. So I'd, I'd love to just uh, follow up really quickly on that and take it in a slightly different direction. It, as you're establishing a vision and, and goals for the next 100 years and beyond, uh, innovation has to be a really important part of that conversation. You, you just mentioned uh, InBev, uh, AB InBev's City Pilots, and I know that you also have the 100-plus uh, Accelerator. Can can you talk a little bit about those two in, in in relation to innovation and why it's important for the company? This accelerator was uh, was built with the uh, with the I'm, with the framework of uh, what we called our 2025 uh, sustainability goals, which are our most ambitious sustainability goals ever um, that we launched a couple of years ago. Um, actually, it was March 2018, um, and we realized that the goals were so ambitious that our company uh, cannot achieve them alone. Uh, so through the 100 plus accelerator, what we're trying to do is to connect uh, with a community of innovators so we can join efforts uh, and solve or provide ideas to solve the, the world's biggest challenges uh, from an environmental standpoint. We launched this initiative last year. We were overwhelmed by the success of the program. Initially, we received 650 submissions from around the globe, from 12 countries and across the five continents. So this is a truly global, uh, a truly global effort. We uh, selected 21 finalists to 21 startups that we support in three different ways. First, we pilot opportunities within AB InBev. Second, we provide the uh, companies with uh, with active mentorship in a top network of uh, of mentors 
from scientists to members of the academia, uh, academic world to domain experts. Uh, we also help them to connect uh, with venture capitalists and uh, to corporate sustainability leaders. And, and third, uh, we also provide funding uh, for those companies. And the idea, again, is to make sure that through these partnerships and through partnering with, uh, with the best and the brightest, uh, bringing innovation to solve uh, a big and very complex uh, problems. So let me tell you a little bit about BankQ. And BankQ is one of the uh, companies that, uh, that were part of our cohort uh, of the 100 Plus Accelerator. BankQ's mission is to bring a dignity through identity. Um, it is a company that was co-founded by Ashish Kadnis and a group of very talented partners. Um, as part of our 100 uh, plus uh, accelerator program, we have been working with them uh, in different programs in several countries. Uh, and uh, not only that, but we recently announced an equity investment in BankU. The initial work uh, with BankU is to provide financial ad- identity to farmers in developing countries that otherwise do not have access to banking system. Historically, cassava growers uh, have been dealing with us uh, in Germany through intermediaries, but they had little access or no opportunity to prove that they were actually suppliers of SAB or ABMF. Uh, they had no invoices uh, or documents to prove that they actually ran a family business. Through the use of BankQ and with uh, blockchain technology, these uh, cassava farmers now get records of their transactions in their phones by SMS. And through having this information, uh, they have much better basis to negotiate with intermediaries. And, uh, and by providing uh, that they are suppliers of or cassava, uh, they can have access to microloans. Uh, so when dealing with, uh, with banks, now they can prove that they are our suppliers. And they can use these microloans uh, to grow their business or to support their family needs. Uh, in addition, they now have a safe way to keep their savings because they no longer receive uh, cash. Um, now they receive uh, payments, records that they can prove by uh, an SMS. Um, since then, uh, by working with the BankU, we have found several other applications of their business model and their technology to our business, which are we are piloting now in several countries. And uh, this partnership, uh, in my opinion, is an excellent example of bringing people together for a better world. Now let me go to RSU Brazil. And their mission is to take waste from landfills and transform it into clean energy. RSU Brazil was also part of the first cohort of our 100 plus accelerator. And uh, I think it's an excellent example of circular economy. Uh, For those who know, Brazil's waste system has a number of unique characteristics. Um, on the one hand, it has a high degree of humidity, which uh, sets it apart from the waste produced in other parts of the world. Uh, so uh, technologies, uh, especially designed by, by RSU Brazil, um, is aiming to properly treat this uh, waste uh, and, and, uh, and really uh, make it more manageable. So uh, the idea of, uh, or the principle behind this technology is to eliminate the, mo- the moisture, uh, to compress the waste, and to make it more manageable with the purposes of creating uh, clean energy through it. Um, So again, it's a principle of going from waste uh, to wealth or from waste to clean energy in this case. Uh, Our partnership with RSU Brazil has allowed uh, this startup to improve their process, uh, to produce better quality biomass from waste, and to confirm the consistency of the waste parameters uh, that they need uh, from recovered recyclable materials. Again, another great example of bringing people together for a better world. Uh, and, and I want to use the opportunity, if you allow me, to, uh, to mention to your audience that we are uh, now in the second cohort of the uh, 100 Plus Accelerator. Uh, in the month of August, we launched our new challenges uh, and, and uh, the invitation is open now. So I want to spread the word. Uh, please uh, visit www dot one zero zero accelerator dot com and uh and join us for this wonderful program um and we're really looking for for partnerships and innovators to tackle the most complex problems you you just co- you cover on uh, so many um areas of uh, pablo it's just it's such smart 
um, execution of a global brand and corporation with 500 brands. It's, it's, uh, you're, you've got me like, oh, my back of my heels and I'm just loving it. Um, we're, we're unfortunately, <laughs> we're, you're going to become my favorite, favorite company around the globe. <laughs> and I've had some really good favorites. I, I've been weaned on, uh, on Unilever for, for so many years, but I want to take you, uh, y- your stories and your approaches are just extraordinary and really, really smart. I think this might be Carol's play for a lifetime supply of beer. So just, just be uh, aware of that. No, 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 no. I, I, no, I just want to hang, I want to hang out with Pablo. You got it. <laughs> we always like to ask, and you've given us a lot of insights along the way, but if you could give three core insights to your colleagues who want to evolve their company's engagement with society through a stated purpose that's very, very authentic. What are three of the most important insights you can share? I would say, Carol, that the three would be the first one. uh, Find something that is authentic to who you are and what your company stands for. Something that is true and that can hold up over time. Second, inspire others. Look for areas where you can really move your employees and create a rally cry, but also you have the capacity to inspire your consumers. And third, the importance of partnerships. No one can do it alone, and partnerships are absolutely essential for driving real change at scale. So again, be authentic, inspire others, and partnerships are essential. I think that uh, there's there's still more to talk about, right? I'd love to talk about uh, specific brands and and how the purpose reflects out to them. But you you guys have done a great job uh, with your Corona properties and and uh, some of the stellar work that you've done in in just making all of this come to life in different ways. Thank you. I really appreciate the the thoughtfulness that you guys bring to purpose and and the effectiveness that you use to radiate it out to the community and the customer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. It has been a very, very interesting and super pleasant conversation and look forward to the next opportunity. And uh, thanks for opening the space to talk a little bit about our company and how passionate we feel about bringing people together for a better world uh, with beer. Oh, you, you do a phenomenal job. And um, I, I know that the word authenticity is thrown around a lot um, outside of this conversation. and it, And it's kind of no, not with a lot of great depth. And I think that in this situation, Pablo, and with AB InBev, um, your authenticity, starting with the high level, your North Star purpose, your long-term vision, your recognition of what your product does, and your responsibilities, and also your, you know, Carlos Brito's commitment to performance, to grow. Um, all of this comes together in a just a a delicious, delicious, since we're talking about food and beverage um, company. And uh, kudos to you. And um, we would like to invite you back uh, because I think there's so much more to learn. So we will do that. We'll say that to uh, hopefully you'll say yes. And um, we'd like to end today. It was a wonderful conversation. So much more to cover. Um, but it's brilliant, brilliant, thoughtful, and smart work. And we know that you're on a journey, but it's a powerful journey. So we want to end today and ask our listeners um, to think about what is your purpose um, and how can you take these incredible insights from AB InBev and apply it to your work. So thank you so much, Pablo. Thank you, Chris. It was a wonderful conversation. And we look forward to the next one. Carol, Chris, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks again. Take care.